pleasure to have you. Well, th thank you very much, and I note that a lot of your readers have come to our site, and I appreciate it. Yeah, we, well, we've got some, some great readers, and they're interested in knowing uh, the truth as best they can find it, and uh, we have a, a way of being at our site, which is uh, we really like to keep our facts very separated from our opinions, something I, I really admire that you do as well. Well, thanks. So uh, let's briefly review, you know, if we could just very quickly synopsize, I think you can do this better than anybody. What happened at Fukushima? You know, what, what happened, in, and, and I really would like to take the opportunity to uh, um, talk about this kind of specifically, like, like where we are with each one of the reactors. So, so first of all, th this disaster, um, how did it happen? Was it, just, was it bad engineering? Was it, was it really bad luck uh, with the tsunami? How did, this, how did this even initiate? Something we were told again and again, something that couldn't happen, seems to have happened. Well, the, the one little bit of physics here is that even when a reactor shuts down, it continues to churn out heat. Now, not, now only 5% of the original amount of heat, but you know, when you're cranking out um, millions of horsepower of heat, 5% is still a lot. So you have to keep a nuclear reactor cool after it shut down. Now, what happened at Fukushima was um, it, it went into what's called a station blackout. And, and people plan for that. Um, they, uh, that means there's no power to anything except for batteries. And batteries can't turn the massive motors that are required to cool the nuclear reactor. So the plan is in a station blackout that somehow or other you get power back in, um, in four or five hours. Um, that didn't happen at Fukushima because the, um, the, the tidal wave, the tsunami, was so great that um, it overwhelmed their, their um, diesels and it overwhelmed something called service water too. But in any event, they couldn't get any power to the big pumps. Now, was it foreseeable? They were prepared for a seven-meter tsunami, about 22 feet. Um, the tsunami that hit was, was something in excess of 10 and quite likely 15 meters, so somewhere between 35 and 45 feet. They were warned that the tsunami that they were designed against was too low. They were warned for at least 10 years, and, and I'm sure there were people back before that. So would they have been prepared for one this big? I don't know, but certainly they were unprepared for um, even a tsunami of lesser magnitude. So the tsunami came, came along and just swamped the systems. And uh, I, I heard that, you know, there were some other design elements there, too, such as potentially there, there were um, the generators were, were in an unsafe spot or that maybe some of their electrical substations all happened to be in the basement. Um, so so they, kind of, they kind of got taken out all at once. Now, here's what I heard was, you know, the, the, the initial reports when they came out, they said, oh, no, nothing to fear. Um, they all went into scram, which is some sort of emergency shutdown. And, and they said everything scrammed. And I knew that we were in trouble within less than 24 hours. They talked about how they were pumping seawater in, which I assume by the time you're pumping seawater, you, you, you have a pretty clear indication from the outside that there's something really quite wrong with this story. Is that true? Uh, yes. Uh, seawater and um, as anybody who's ever had a boat on the ocean would know, you know, salt water and stainless steel do not get along very well. And salt water and stainless steel at 500 degrees don't get along very well at all. Um, and then uh, you're right, they had some single points of vulnerability, you know, the, the hole in the armor. Um, the diesels were one of them, but even if the diesels were up high, they would have been in trouble because of those service water pumps I talked about. And they got wiped out, and those pumps are the pumps that cool the diesels. So even if the diesels were runnable, the cooling water that runs through the diesels would have been taken out by the tsunami mm -hmm. anyway. So it's kind of a, a, a false argument that it, to, blame, to blame the diesels. Okay, so, so take us through. So reactor number one, um, you know, it, it was revealed, I think, about a week ago now that, that they finally came to, to the revelation that I think some of us had come to independently, uh, that there had been something more than, than a, a partial meltdown, maybe even a complete meltdown. What, what's your assessment of reactor one, and where is it right now? When you see hydrogen explosions, that means that the outside of the fuel has exceeded 2,200 degrees, and the inside is well over 3,500 degrees. The fuel gets um, brittle. It burns, and then it plops to the bottom of the, um, of the nuclear reactor in a molten blob like lava. Um, it was pretty clear to a lot of people, including apparently to the NRC, but they weren't telling people back in March, that that had occurred in Unit 1, that there was essentially um, 
a blob of lava on the bottom of the nuclear reactor. Now, we've got to separate. There's a nuclear reactor, and that is inside of a containment. So there's still one more barrier here. But the problem is that it, the reactor had boiled dry, and they were using fire pumps connected to the ocean to pump um, salt water into the reactor. Now, if this thing were individual tubes, the water could get around the uh, uranium and completely cool it. But when it's a blob at the bottom of the reactor, it can only get to the top surface, and that would cause it to begin the meltdown. Now, on these boiling water reactors, there's about 70 holes in the bottom of the reactor where the control rods come in. And um, I suspect that those holes were essentially the weak link that caused this molten mass. Now it's 5,000 degrees at the center. Even though the outside may be touching water, the inside of this molten mass is 5,000 degrees. Um, it melts through and lays on the bottom of the containment. That's where we are today. We have no uh, reactor, um, essentially a big pressure cooker, um, and the molten uh, uranium is on the bottom of the containment. The, it spreads out at that point because the floor is flat. And I don't think it's going to melt its way through the, the concrete floor. Um, it may gradually over time. But the damage is already done because the containment has, um, has cracks in it, and it's pretty clear that it's leaking. So you're putting water in the top, and the plan had never been to put water in the top and let it run out the bottom. That is not the preferred way of cooling a nuclear reactor in an accident. But you're putting water in the top, it's running out the bottom, and it's going out through cracks in the containment. After touching directly uranium and plutonium and cesium and strontium, it's carrying all those radioactive isotopes out as liquids and gases into the environment. Yeah. So, so um, I, this melting that happened, is this just a function of the decay heat at this point in time? We're not speculating that there's been any sort of recriticality or any other, you know, nu what we might call a nuclear reaction. This is just decay heat from the uh, isotopes that are in there from, from prior nuclear activity. Uh, those are just decaying and giving off that heat. That's sufficient to get to 5,000 degrees? Yes. Once the uranium melts into a blob at these low enrichments, 4 or 5%, it can't make a, a new criticality. If there's criticalities occurring on the site, and there might be because there's still iodine-131, which is an indication, it's not coming from the unit one core and it's not coming from the unit two core because those are both blobs at the bottom of the containment. All right, so we have these blobs. They, they've, they've somehow escaped the primary um, reactor pressure vessel, which is that big steel thing, and now they're, they're on the f relatively flat floor of the containment, the concrete piece. And you say Unit 2 is, is roughly the same story as Unit 1. Um, where's Unit 3 in this story, then? Unit 3 may not have melted through, and that means that some of the fuel um, certainly is lying on the bottom, but it may not have melted through. Um, and some of the fuel may still still look like fuel, although it's certainly brittle. Um, and it's possible when the fuel is in that configuration that um, you can get a recriticality. It's also possible in any of the fuel pools, unit one, two, three, and four fuel pool, that you could get a, a criticality as well. So um, there's been frequent enough um, high iodine indications to lead me to believe that either one of the four fuel pools or the Unit 3 reactor is, um, is in fact, every once in a while starting itself up. And, uh, and then it gets to a point where it gets so hot it shuts itself down. And it kind of cycles. It kind of breathes, if you will. Right. So, but it's, it's, when it's doing that breathing, it's, it's certainly generating a lot of heat uh, through the fission process. And then, of course, it's generating more isotopes to decay and c contribute to decay heat at that point. Um, what, what's your assessment if there is that sort of breathing going on? Is this like a little pocket within one of the uh, geometries that exists that would still allow fission to be supported? Or could, could you imagine this being a fairly significant amount? Or how much do you think might be happening? I think it's a relatively significant amount. You know, maybe uh, a tenth of the nuclear reactor core hmm. starts back up and shuts back down and starts back up and shuts back down. And that's an extra heat load. You know, you're not prepared to get rid of one-tenth of a nuclear reactor's heat mm. by pumping water in the top. Now, Unit 3 has another problem, and the NRC mentioned it yesterday for the first time, and it gets back to that salt water and the effect on iron. They're afraid that the reactor bottom will break, 
literally just break right out and dump everything. Um, because it's now hot and it's got salt on it and it's got the ideal conditions for corrosion. So the, the big fear on Unit 3 is that um, it will break at the bottom and whatever else is, remains in it, which could be the entire core, uh, could fall out suddenly. And if that happens, you can get something called a steam explosion. Um, and this may be a one in a hundred chance. I, I don't want your listeners to think it's going to happen tomorrow. But if the core breaks, you will get a steam explosion. But we're not sure the core is going to break. And that's a that's a violent hydrogen explosion like the one we've already witnessed. Reactor three caught me when when it when it blew because what I saw there with my eyes was was a a fairly focused upwards um, very high energy event which completely looked different from what I saw when when unit one blew. Um, are you talking about is, is that or or because I know you've you've postulated in the past that you think that um, if there might have been a what was the name for it a prompt? Yeah, criticality. The, I called it a prompt criticality that created a detonation. And the engineers differentiate. It was a, either way, it's going to be a big explosion. But the violence of Unit Three's explosion, um, and I did some calculations to show that the speed at which it, the, the, the flame traveled and in order to throw particles as far as this one throw through particles, the speed of that shock wave had to be in excess of 1,000 miles an hour. And, and that's a detonation where the shock wave itself can cause incredible damage. And that can happen if we were to have one of these steam explosions. If the bottom of the reactor on Unit 3 falls out, um, you could have another one of those all over again. And, and uh, obviously a, a, not a good thing if that happens. What can they do at this stage, though, if that's a concern they have? Uh, uh, this, sounds, this sounds very tricky to me because if it turns out that, that there's excess heat being generated because we're having this breathing um, recriticality event going on in there, but for whatever reason, let's just say the core of Reactor 3 is pretty hot, um, how, what can they really do beyond um, just keep trying to dump water in there and keep their fingers crossed? Um, well, that's two out of the three things they have to do. <laughs> uh, the, the other one is they can flood it, if, if they can flood it from the outside. In other words, put water outside the pressure cooker as well as inside the pressure cooker. Um, they may be able to remove more heat that way and prevent the, 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 the gross failure of the, of the pressure vessel. But really, it's just you know hoping that you can put enough water in. And uh, the other piece of that is, and it relates to Unit 4, too, is, um, is a seismic event. Um, if you put too much water in these reactors, they, they get heavy. And they're not designed to sway when they're as heavy as these things have hundreds, of, uh, tens of tons of extra water in them. So they're really not designed to sway. So if there's a severe aftershock, um, unit 3 and, um, and Unit 4 are in real jeopardy. And if you remember the, the Sumatra uh, earthquake, that was the 9 plus about three or four years ago, um, the biggest aftershock occurred three months afterward, and that was in 86. So um, aftershocks, uh, even though we're two months into this, um, if the Sumatra event is any indication, aftershocks are still possible. Right, and, and so you mentioned Unit 4 then. Um, also being at risk for this. I, I thought the Unit 4, the, the core was out um, and that the, the, it, they have some water back in the pool. What's the concern with Unit 4 at this point? Um, you're absolutely right. There's no, um, there's no reactor running there. Everything had been taken out and was put in the spent fuel pool. But that means there's no containment either. So the entire uh, spent fuel pool is visible. Literally, when they have those helicopter flyovers, you can look down into this blown out shell of a building and see the, um, the fuel in the spent fuel pool. It's still relatively hot because it only shut down in November. So there's still a lot of decay heat in that pool. Um, Brookhaven National Labs did a study in uh, 1997. And it said that if a fuel pool went dry and caught on fire, um, it could cause 187,000 fatalities. So it's a big concern. Um, and probably the biggest concern, I, I know Chairman Yasko of the NRC said that the reason he told um, the Americans to get out from 50 miles out was he was afraid of Unit 4 catching fire, that, that exposed fuel pool would volatilize plutonium, uranium, and cesium and strontium 